Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Welcome to the uh, Southeast Branch webinar for July uh, 23, which was entitled Preventing Slips, Trips and Falls. Um, I'm going to introduce Rob Shaw, our guest speaker, shortly. But um, before I do that, just wanted to, to note that we're recording the webinar. Uh, it's going to be uploaded to the IISM YouTube channel shortly afterwards. Um, and as we, uh, as we approach the presentation or the webinar, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, sec uh, section of the uh, of the Zoom um, panel, uh, and we'll approach and address those at the back end uh, of the presentation. Uh, I also wanted just to make one uh, short notice on behalf of IIRSM um, as, a, as a branch update or as a uh, as an organisation update to remind us all that uh, you may be familiar that the deadline for the next hummingbird bursary uh, is the Monday, thirty first of July, uh, twenty twenty three. Uh, and just as a very quick reminder. The, the bursary is a collaboration between IISM and L'Oreal, um, which is all about encouraging greater representation among uh, those responsible for managing risk at work, um, for which successful applicants are going to be rewarded with a place on the IISM Managing Risk, the Essentials Training Course, uh, which this time around will take place uh, towards the back end of uh, September 23. Uh, the details uh, you'll see, I'm sure, on LinkedIn. Um, we can provide uh, additional um, uh, information on that if anybody would like it by just noting it in the Q&A session. Um, uh, but essentially uh, the bursaries will apply, uh, or sorry, the individual will apply uh, for a bursary via the, the training at IISM.org uh, email channel, where you can submit a, a CV and an explanation in 500 words of how the bursary would support the individuals developing and managing risk in their workplace, but also promoting inclusivity uh, in risk management. And the deadline is Monday the 31st of July. Uh, so with that aside, moving on to our webinar for today, a big welcome to Rob Shaw, who joins us from uh, Rob Shaw Associates, and we'll be sharing some insights around the, the prevention of uh, slips, trips and falls. And, and Rob will introduce himself in a little more detail, um, but it is fair to say Rob's an expert in his field. He spent 20 years providing scientific expertise to the health and safety executive and commercial organisations, both at home and abroad, uh, and having previously served as HSE's technical lead for the falls uh, prevention team. Rob, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, thank you very much and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Matt. Hopefully everybody can hear me and can see the slides. Um, yeah, I suppose I'm your resident slips nerd for the day. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the, the key issues behind preventing slips, trips and falls. Um, any of you who caught the webinar that I did uh, the back end of last year, I think it was December last year, might recognize some of the content, but there's some new stuff in here as well. Um, and it's all relevant. Uh, so as Matt said, my background is 20 years doing nothing but preventing slips, trips and falls. Uh, so the first 15 years of that were with the health and safety executive, the UK regulator for, for health and safety, uh, where I was the technical lead for the falls prevention team. So the day job was very much incident investigation, undertaking HSE's research, helping write policy and guidance, um, but also helping commercial clients reduce fall risk. Um, and for the last five years, I've been doing that independently for myself, but the same job. Um, my business partner, Rachel, uh, was also a, an ex-HSE project manager. Very good to have a project manager on board when you're a scientist, because we are not the most organized by nature. Um, and she managed not only the commercial and, and technical projects that we did uh, in the falls prevention team at HSE, uh, but she also has 10 years experience of, of delivering training and consultancy and, and running her own business. Um, it's worth pointing out that Rachel is also my wife, so she manages all aspects of my life. Um, and that joke is easier to do when you're not doing this on a webinar and she's sitting in the next room. So if anyone barges in, I, I went too far on that one. Uh, so my background is all things slips, trips and falls. And what we're going to talk about is all those things, slips, trips and falls, mainly in the guise of stair falls, very briefly. Um, but it's worth starting here. And anyone who saw my last presentation will probably recognise this video, but I think it's a key starting point for where the issues are in all organisations with how we approach the management of risk around slips, trips and falls. This is an example from the steel stockholding industry. It was one that I was asked to share by the, the company involved because they'd learned great lessons from it. Um, and we're going to see an individual in a very high risk industry dealing with uh, very dangerous product, extremely heavy product, where they take a lot of safety precautions around the movement of vehicles, segregation of vehicles and pedestrians. We'll see somebody in the video walking in the background underneath a, a roll of steel, but he's walking to the side, he's outside the area of danger, he's outside the hazard, and they're managing these risks. 
that what are often seen as the smaller, simpler risks, slips, trips and falls, the very minor things, are not being managed as well. So in this example here, and hopefully the, the video will play and you'll all be able to see it, but the cradle on the back of the vehicle for holding the steel rolls and making sure that they don't dislodge in transit leaves a significant uneven surface on the back of this vehicle. So this guy's job is to replace these panels after the, the steel rolls have been removed so that he's got a level safe surface to work on. Now, as he drops this one, it's heavy, so he doesn't place it, he drops it and it bounces. It doesn't sit right and it shifts as he treads on it. So two things happen here. The first is a fall on the level. He falls on the same level that he's on and has a very nasty impact. And I believe he broke his hip. But then because of where he is, he rotates off the vehicle. He's unfortunate enough to lose his hard hat because it's not strapped on and suffers very nasty head injury and several other injuries to his legs. Uh, and I believe possibly his arms as well. Very serious incident. I think he was off work for about eight months. And we can all sit here and watch this video and think, well, there's a lot that could be done about that. And the business learned a lot from this incident. They changed the way that they manage this task. The exposure to risk is no longer there. They're able to put up edge protection, to have barriers next to the, uh, the platform with stair access, potentially clip on to stop people going over the edge of the vehicle. They learned lots of very good lessons, but they learned them from this scene. They learned them after somebody fell off and then some risk assessment was done and some risk management was put into place. And that's the common problem that we see with slips, trips and falls. <laughs> Most organisations are typically reactive rather than proactive when we come to dealing with the issue. We'll talk about some of the common misconceptions around slips, trips and falls and why we're, we tend to be reactive rather than proactive. The solutions to the issues are quite often very simple. Selecting those solutions, though, requires good scientific evidence. And the selection of those solutions is rarely evidence based. So what happens is we've all had experience of a slip, a trip or a fall. We've all been there. And so somebody has a fall. Someone within the, the organization says, well, if we did this, that wouldn't have happened. It's taken as read because it always sounds very simple. The solutions typically are. So that's done. And it either works or it doesn't. Um, but it's not really assessed very well. And we don't always understand the underlying root causes. And we don't know that we're managing that risk well. We'll explore that in the next few slides. One of the other challenges is that there are many different standards out there for how slippery your floors are, how good your slip resistant footwear is, that kind of thing, that aren't actually particularly helpful in making an informed choice and in successfully managing risk. And there's lots of expertise in the field which has a commercial interest behind it. People who are trying to sell a floor treatment or a flooring product or a type of footwear. And because there are so many different standards tests and so many different sources of information, they're able to draw on the ones that flatter the product they're trying to sell and make quite a convincing argument. But in reality, it doesn't really help you manage risk. So what we'll talk about over the next sort of 35, 40 minutes are some of those root causes, some of those misconceptions that we can look at and some examples of solutions. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions, as Matt said. Um, and if there are any further questions after today, I'll leave my contact details up as well as part of the video and people can get in touch. So there are four key common misconceptions around slips, trips and falls that tend to lead us astray. So there are four statements here and none of them are true. The first is that slips, trips and falls are rarely serious. You know, we deal with lots of significant issues in many different industries, management of chemicals, high hazard industries, falls from height, which are often seen as very different from a slip or a trip, although in reality, the two are very closely linked. Uh, things that can injure a lot of people in a single incident whereas slips, trips and falls typically injure one individual and really do they happen that often? Are they that serious? They're often seen as very, very simple. The causes are seen as very, very simple. And while the solutions are typically simple, some of the causes are a bit more complex. And we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail later on. Falls are typically seen as human error and only human error. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and that there's ultimately little that you can do to prevent them. And some of that misconception is reinforced by the fact that people have done something to prevent risk. They've put in place risk management procedures, often at great personal expense of time, money, other things invested. And they found that the rate of incidents doesn't reduce. 
And so they fall back on that third point. Well, in that case, it's human error. People need to pay more attention. Whereas in reality, actually, we can do a lot to manage that risk. So I'm going to talk about lots of different things over the next sort of half hour. I don't expect them all to stick um, or for everything to, to be uppermost in everyone's minds, but hopefully there's something of interest for everybody throughout the session. So let's start with the four misconceptions and dispelling those a little bit. So first off, falls are serious. The stats tell us this. They're the leading cause of non-fatal major workplace injuries in the UK. They have been for over 20 years. They're typically about 30% of all the non-fatal reportable injuries in the UK workplace every year. And just to give you an idea, that's true across the world. So in the US, um, in 2020, it was about 18% of non-fatal work injuries resulting in days from work. They categorise slightly differently. And then I thought, just to put a slightly more domestic spin on it and to look at um, the risk of stair falls rather than typical slips and trips, uh, taking some information from the British Standard, and this is now quite a long time ago this, this British Standard was published, um, over 500 deaths a year in the domestic setting on stairs. And again, that's uh, backed up by a significant number more of non-fatal but serious injuries, both in the home, in the workplace, and in public spaces, leisure environments, retail environments. So steps and stairs account for, particularly in my line of work, the most significant burden of serious injury and fatality. So falls are serious. The next issue is, well, the causes are very simple. Actually, the causes are not particularly simple in many cases. The solutions to reduce risk are relatively simple. It might have to do with the floor, it might have to do with the footwear or the cleaning regime or the management of leaks and spills. But understanding which of those simple solutions you need for your given problem means conducting a proper, genuine, inquisitive root cause analysis of which different things are contributing to risk. And we'll think about those root causes in the next few slides. But that lack of understanding, that assumption that they are very simple and that ultimately they're probably just human error, leads to either the identification of inappropriate risk management interventions or the conclusion that no risk management intervention is necessary. I'm working right now on a, a data analysis for a client of mine and running through the data, one phrase comes out again and again and again as the only action in response to a slip, a trip or a fall. And that was be more aware of surroundings. That doesn't help address the underlying hazards. In many of these cases, somebody slipped on a floor that had a spill on it, somebody tripped on an obstacle. It doesn't address that root cause. It merely puts the onus on the individual who had the incident and then assumes that by doing so, the next person to use that environment won't struggle with that obstacle again. So then we've come to human error, this assumption that typically falls are, are the cause or are the result of human error. Um, you know, should have been paying more attention, wasn't looking where they were going. In reality, all falls will involve a human error at some point. The human has made an error in maintaining a normal, safe walking gait. But the likelihood of that error is heavily influenced by the environment they're in, the job that they're doing, and other factors both about themselves and about the jobs. So assuming that human error is the only root cause, leaves us nowhere to go in terms of risk management. If human error is the cause, tell people to pay more attention. That won't be effective because the way we walk is largely a subconscious process. We don't walk around thinking about how we're going to deal with hazards. We, we look at them as we scan the environment and we deal with them without even realizing we're doing it, stepping over curbs and single steps, avoiding spills and so on. So assuming that it's, it's purely human error, it means that we don't identify the true root causes which means we put the wrong simple solutions on the problem we've got potentially. So while human error is an important part of any slip, trip or fall, and things like distraction from using mobile phones or the effects of drugs and alcohol are an important key contributing factor to many different slips, trips and falls, they're rarely the only factor. So all things need to be considered. And then the last one is you can't really do anything about slips, trips and falls. And I can certainly say after building a 20 year career on it, that prevention is possible. And we're going to talk about a few different examples um, over the next few slides of where things have been done, where things have gone right, where things have gone wrong. But as one example, um, when I was at HSE, my team worked with one of the most famous grade one listed buildings in the centre of London. We were working at the National Gallery um, in Trafalgar Square and they had three entrances 
um, uh, between the columns, sort of um, uh, through the arches facing out to Nelson's column. And they were having trips and, and stumbles at that entrance, not a significant burden. They were having about 15 reportable incidents a year, but they had a very good monitoring system. They had a great safety team and they were capturing lots of near misses amongst all of those reportable incidents. And they asked the question, is this the price of doing business when you have 4 million visitors a year, or is there something else we could do to help to minimize this risk? And so we monitored those entrances with cameras. And on the day that we filmed, we filmed three entrances um, and a poor colleague of mine who counted every single movement in and out of that building logged twelve and a half thousand journeys through that entrance in different directions. And on that day, as far as the gallery are concerned, they'd had a perfect day because there were no reports, no incidents, no injuries. Nobody made a report to the gallery. None of their safety team spotted anything on their near misreporting system. So as far as they know, there haven't been any incidents. But on camera, we captured 466 missteps, stumbles and falls and nine people who were obviously injured, people who fell, people who cut their legs, people who twisted their ankles. So there was an underlying level of risk there and of near misses that weren't captured. When we looked at that, we were able to determine what the common causes were and we made some recommendations. They made some changes to the design of those entrances. And we're talking about one of the most carefully controlled grade one listed buildings in the UK. They cost a few hundred pounds. They weren't permanent modifications to the building, but they made the steps more obvious. They made the transition easier. And we reduced the rate of people tripping going into the building by about 34 percent when we filmed again and we did a comparison. And we're talking at about twelve and a half thousand journeys. So a significant sample size that shows you can reduce risk if you genuinely understand those root causes. I'm going to talk very briefly about gathering the evidence because what a near miss is around slips, trips and falls is often misunderstood. Typically a near miss is seen as a fall where there's no reportable injury or where there's no claim as a result. In reality, the true near miss event for a slip or a trip is either a fall with no injury at all or even a slip or a trip without a fall. That whoo, moment but you catch yourself and two steps later you carry on that immediately is telling you if you've slipped there's not quite enough grip here between the footwear I'm wearing the floor I'm walking on and any contamination on it if you trip over something it's telling you there's an obstacle in my path that I wasn't anticipating that's the near miss event but those are really hard to capture because people three steps later are moving on with navigating the rest of the environment if people do fall but don't hurt themselves the first thing we tend to find is it's quite embarrassing. So we make sure nobody saw and we dust ourselves off and we carry on. So it's quite common that the first time you hear of a slip or a trip issue is when somebody's been seriously injured. And when it comes to steps and stairs, certainly more than once, I've been standing by a flight of stairs with a building owner who's unfortunately had a fatality on that stair. And the first thing they say is, well, we've never had an issue on this stair. We've been here 30 years. And yet we can stand there for half an hour while I'm doing my assessment and we can watch four or five people struggling to get up and down that stair safely. But none of that's recorded. None of it's known. So understanding those near misses and gathering better data is really critical in order to be proactive rather than reactive, as we talked about at the beginning. I'm going to give one quick example of a good way to do this. Um, this is an organisation I work with, which is proactively. Um, some of you may know proactively. The reason I like this system and the reason I've worked with them is because I used to do my training and I would talk about near misses and capturing good data. And someone would always say, well, what does good incident reporting look like? And I'd struggle to answer that question because I'd very rarely seen it. This system has a number of things that I like. So first of all, it's a mobile system. So you've got a mobile app and it has a number of report forms on it. And they could be for anything from hazard spotting, near miss reporting, incident investigation all the way through to productivity toilet cleaning schedules anything that you need to monitor and they can be sent out to relevant teams but they're customized by the organization so the first important thing is the organization can decide what information it wants to gather rather than just having a tick box that says well it must be a slip trip or fall in the drop down now write something in the free text box to tell us what happened which relies on the individual doing the reporting to understand the ins and outs of why people slip, trip and fall in order to give you the data you want. This can ask some more pointed questions. You can attach photographs, you can GPS tag things, you can do all sorts of very fancy things with it. 
the thing I like about it then is it feeds back to a, a computer-based dashboard, so web-based dashboard, so that the supervisors, the people who receive these reports, can then analyze them. So that's the first critical thing that a good reporting system needs, is the ability to query it, to understand trends, to understand how quickly issues are being dealt with, are they being acted upon in time, to understand whether there's a certain part of the, the estate or a certain business, certain estate within the business that has higher rates of incidence, to understand how many slips and trips versus manual handling do we have? Are the two often interrelated? All those important questions so that we're not gathering data for data's sake, but we're gathering information to help us proactively manage risk. And the thing that I like most about this, and that's my personal opinion, is there is a feedback loop. Because it's a web-based app, when somebody puts a report in, the management team are able to receive the report, see what's been put through, and they can immediately type a quick text response that says, thank you very much for this. This is what we're going to do. And it will pop up on the mobile device like any other messaging service. That feedback loop is so important to keep people engaged in the reporting process. What often happens is somebody will fill out a report form either on paper or electronically, and they'll send it off to the relevant place via email or putting it in the box. Those things then take time to act upon. If there's a broken tile in the production line and it needs to be fixed, the report goes in and then the management have to assign it to somebody and they have to find budget for it and get maintenance crews on it. So it might take a few days, a few weeks, a few months to fix that. Meanwhile, the individual who reported that walks past it and over it and around it every single day for the next two weeks, three weeks, two months. And it reinforces the idea that, well, I've reported that and nothing's happened about it. So there's no point. And they lose engagement with the reporting process and you lose that information that's really important and is coming up through all levels of the organization. With this, you're able to say, that's brilliant. We've put it on the maintenance schedule. We won't be able to fix it for a month because there's no budget available or because we haven't got maintenance time available. What we'll do in the interim is we will highlight it with some hazard tape or whatever the, the interim solution is. And the individual understands that that's been heard and something's been done about it. And in learning about the, uh, the, the data that's being gathered, you can also then review and reassign some of those forms that have been developed. So if you think actually the last year was brilliant, but from our incident investigation data, we're not logging the time of day they're happening or we're not logging whereabouts in the building they are, you can add that into your form and you can continue to evolve and improve the process. So it's one example of a really good system for capturing good quality data. So I'll move on then to talk about the meaty stuff, why we're here, preventing slips, preventing trips, preventing falls. And I think the big lesson, if you take nothing else away from today, is that slips, trips and falls is not one word. I'll say it a lot in very quick succession, but they're three very different things. Slips are completely different from trips. The root causes are different. The solutions to those problems are different. And when it comes to falls, particularly, I'm going to talk about stair falls later on, they've got their own root causes and challenges. So we'll start by preventing slips. And that's because slips are a little bit more complex than trips. And they're the ones where we, we often struggle to get the right level of detail to be proactive and to understand the level of risk that we already have in terms of people slipping. In terms of a slips hierarchy, right up at the top there, the collective control that protects everybody walking on it is the flooring. If the floor is suitable, fit for purpose, and not slippery in its normal operating condition, which is the legal expectation, then people shouldn't be slipping on it. And there's a, an assumption that all floors will be slippery when they're wet, because wet floors are slippery. And that's absolutely not true, or we wouldn't be able to walk about outside when it's raining, as it quite gloriously is where I am right now. Actually, there are some floors out there that are fantastic in the, the wet condition, that do not present a significant potential for slipping. And even in a, a more challenging condition with oil, with grease, um, one of the leading fast food retailers in the UK have a tile in their kitchen. It's not particularly abrasive or aggressive to the touch. They can clean it very easily. But if it gets wet, it's not slippery. And if you pour cooking oil on it, it's not slippery. And if you then pour water and cooking oil on it, it's still not slippery, provided they can keep it clean at the end of every shift. So there's excellent slip resistant flooring out there, but identifying it can be quite difficult. And we'll talk about flooring in a few minutes. Where the floor can't cope with being contaminated. So if you've got a smooth, shiny floor 
then it's fine when it's clean and dry, but the moment it gets a bit damp, it gets very slippery, then controlling that contamination is very important. Can you prevent the floor from getting wet in the first place? One of the challenges is that the volume of liquid you need, for example, if you're thinking about water, to create a slip risk on a smooth floor is so small as to be almost insignificant. The thickness of film that's generated when an average pedestrian walks on the floor is about two microns, two millionths of a meter. So in reality, there's no difference between a half inch puddle of water and the level of moisture from a bit of condensation in the air or the dampness on a wet shoe that hasn't been dried on an entrance mat correctly. The level of risk there of someone slipping is exactly the same. When it comes to managing the risk of contamination and flooring, one of the key controls is obviously cleaning. Whether we clean for hygienic reasons or aesthetic reasons or both, we clean to take dirt off the floor. Now, most flooring is not slippery in clean, dry conditions. And with very few exceptions, certain combinations of flooring and footwear material, if the floor is clean and dry and the footwear is clean and dry, you will get excellent grip, regardless of how smooth and shiny they are, regardless of how polished, there's no inherent slip risk in something that you can see your face in, but contamination makes a big difference. So the cleaning really helps to manage that risk. And of all the parts of that process, cleaning is the one where human factors play the strongest role. You can have the best cleaning policy on paper, you can buy all the right equipment, but if the job on the day isn't done well, then the cleaning's not effective. So we'll talk about flooring, we'll talk briefly about cleaning, and last of all, we'll talk about footwear. So footwear's lowest down on that hierarchy of controls because it's personal protective equipment. It only protects that individual, only if they're wearing it and it's in good condition and so on. However, from a slips point of view, footwear can sometimes be the most effective and the most cost effective control available. Sometimes it's the only control available. So we'll also talk about the role of footwear in terms of preventing slips. As I've said, when it comes to flooring, the good news is there's excellent slip resistant flooring available. Wide range of different tests, however, can make it very difficult to select suitable products. So there's lots of different standards internationally. Uh, traditionally, every country sort of had its own way of testing things and they didn't all work and they weren't all relevant, you wouldn't believe, to pedestrian slipping. There were lots of tests out there that will measure how much grip a floor offers, but won't actually tell you what is the risk of a person slipping on this floor when they walk on it. And some of those tests are still widely in use. There's a new European standard now for the testing of slip resistance, but within it, it has several different test methods. Some of them are very good and very effective, some of them not so much. So it can be very difficult. You can go to a manufacturer and say, is this a good slip resistant floor? And in essence, they can find a test that will tell you, yes, it is. But it doesn't really mean that you're controlling the risk as best you can. Um, the regulator, the health and safety executive, obviously has some very good information on which tests do work and why. One of the other challenges is that floors will change over time and some flooring will change very quickly. So most floor products that you might specify, and whether that's for an office building, a production plant, or the back of a vehicle, any surface that could be walked on, it will perform in one way when it's tested as it leaves the production line. But once it's been installed, it's been, it has had its first initial builders clean. Once it's been walked on for three months, once it's had cleaning machines over it for two years, that behavior will change and sometimes very rapidly. So some ceramic surfaces, <clears throat> some natural stone flooring, you'll lose the vast majority of the slip resistance of those products, often within the first few weeks, or sometimes even after the builder's clean has been done. And despite some opinions to the contrary, that does not mean that the builder's clean has been improperly done and has damaged the tile. If the last clean before handover is sufficient to remove the surface texture and remove the slip resistance, so is going to be the first month of opening and pedestrian foot traffic. So durability and longevity of slip resistance is also an important consideration and one that's slightly harder to get a handle on. It's one that lots of people in the academic world are talking about all over the globe. I've been to a couple of conferences in the last few years and we just had one in Toronto uh, last month, I believe, and there was one last year in Japan. And this conversation comes up all the time still. It's, it's a really interesting and important area to be looking at. Now, profiled surfaces, so surfaces like metal checker plate, I'll show some examples in a minute, they're often involved in slips. 
they're not necessarily as slip resistant as people expect. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And you can also modify existing flooring. So there are chemical treatments such as acid etches. There are physical treatments, diamond grinding, grip blasting, coating with, with a resin containing aggregate. There are a number of ways that you can modify the surface finish of the floor you're walking on to improve the level of grip that it offers in contaminated conditions. However, specifying the right floor in the first place that will last for the, the foreseeable duration is far more cost effective and time effective than buying something that isn't fit for purpose, exposes people to risk, and then needs to be treated, monitored, and retreated over time. However, if you have a high risk area, you're not just stuck ripping the flooring up and starting again if the floor is the key control to risk. There are modifications that can be done that can help to manage that risk. So I mentioned profiled flooring. So we've got a couple of uh, metal examples here, some Durbar flooring. So anything with a raised physical pattern. And there's an assumption that that raised physical pattern will give some interlock with footwear and will therefore give you some enhanced grip and some improved slip resistance. And that assumption is actually quite challenging because we take more risks on these surfaces because we assume they're going to give us more grip. In reality, what we expect is case A here, interlock A, where the footwear interlocks perfectly with the flooring and we get enhanced friction. In reality, friction is generated between the floor surface and the footwear by the ability of either the flooring, because of its micro roughness, not its physical pattern, but its surface finish, its abrasiveness, however you'd like to look at it, and the footwear to disperse any contaminants between the two. So much like a car tire, if you can squeeze the water out of the contact patch, you will get contact between the soling material of the shoe and the floor, and you'll get some grip. So you don't need physical profile to give you that enhanced grip. And in fact, what tends to happen is case B on here, where the footwear doesn't interlock with the surface. And in fact, it tends to sit on the peak of that profile. So what you've done there is minimize the contact between the two surfaces. So you're reducing friction already. And the expectation of people is that it will offer some grip. So it's a bit like walking on ice. If you see a patch of ice, you can walk across it. You change the way you walk. You walk a little bit more gingerly. You take shorter steps, but you get to the other side. If you find a patch of black ice, that's when you have your accident because suddenly the floor under your feet didn't offer the friction that you expected. Obviously, if you're relying on the physical interlock to give you the grip, then as soon as you've got any wear in the footwear or wear in the flooring or any change between the two and that interlock is gone, then it potentially breaks down. So it's not to say that all profiled flooring will be slippery, but the problem is the reliance for generating the grip tends to come from that raised physical pattern. So a lot of these will be polished metal surfaces or smooth ceramic surfaces, smooth quarry tile surfaces. If you've got a piece of sheet metal in front of you with no pattern on it whatsoever and it's wet, you'd be relatively cautious starting to walk across that because you're not sure how much grip it will offer. But as soon as someone puts a profiled pattern on it, your brain says, oh, well, it's, this is probably quite good. And off you go, you take more risks. So profiled surfaces are often involved in slip incidents, despite being sold as slip resistant surfaces. Cleaning, obviously, as we've talked about, is a very important process, but technique is critical in successfully cleaning floors. Chemical is important, equipment is important, but the technique is critical. You can have the right chemicals, you can have the right equipment. If you don't use them correctly, you won't effectively clean the floor. So slip resistant flooring can be cleaned successfully to an aesthetic and hygienic standard. So two other misconceptions are we, we can't put a slip resistant floor in here because we won't be able to clean it. It'll be too much hard work or it will look dirty or we have to maintain hygiene standards. And research has shown that that's not true. I'm going to show you a couple of those bits of research in a minute. There's an expectation. The, cleaning procedure itself may need to be changed to be appropriate to the floor type and to the contaminant that's on there, but the flooring can be cleaned successfully to a hygienic and aesthetic finish. In terms of managing the risk that the cleaning process generates, wet floor signs are obviously the most common way of managing that risk. A wet floor sign on its own does not constitute everything reasonably practicable to manage the risk of a cleaning activity. 
it's something reasonably practical that can be done, but it's very rarely going to be everything reasonably practicable. And we know that wet floor signs cause issues. We'll talk about that towards the end. Thinking about the planning of cleaning is very, very important. So when we clean, both for reactive and for, um, for scheduled cleaning, how we clean, where the equipment is kept and so on, it's all very important. And cleaning can both help or hinder. It's a process that requires management, training and review. It's often seen as sort of the lowest part of the work process. So we produce this product and we clean up after we've done it. We serve our customers this excellent food and we mop the floors when we're done. And very little emphasis tends to go into the importance of training cleaners, empowering cleaners and making sure they understand the important bits of why they're asked to do the task they do. So I can't get away with being a scientist without throwing a graph or two in here. So we're going to have some very quick ones. This one was a colleague of ours in Canada who looked at the importance of the right cleaning method. So he went into a number of large commercial kitchens and he measured how much grease was on the floor. Then he asked them to clean it as they normally would. So he made it very clear to them they weren't being assessed. He was just interested in cleaning routines and, and so on. And he said, clean the floor and I'll see how much grease is left. And that's the red bar. So he measured how much grease was on the floor and then how much grease was on the floor following cleaning. And in some cases, as you can see, the red bar, up to 75% of the grease was still on the floor after they'd done their normal daily clean. He then did an improved cleaning regime on that floor. And that was taking their chemicals, their mops, their buckets, their cleaning machines, whatever they used, and cleaning the floor. And in most cases, we'll ignore dash for just a minute. But in most cases, what he did was he reduced the blue bar. He reduced the level of residual grease significantly, particularly in the areas where grease was high on the floor. His improved cleaning regime was he took their equipment and their chemicals and he followed the instructions on the chemical bottle. So he was diluting correctly, he was rinsing correctly, he was doing all the things that the chemical manufacturer said needed to be done. And it shows that it's very easy for people to fall into bad habits, especially if cleaning is sort of the last thing you have to do at the end of the shift before you get to go home. Less emphasis goes into the cleaning process. Now, there are a couple of outliers there. The big one is, is obviously Dash. Once they had cleaned the floor, there was only about 25% of the residual grease left. It was one of the most effective cleans that he found as he got there. When he followed the instructions on the dash bottle, it was significantly worse. I suspect that's because they were doing a very good job cleaning in there for whatever reason, whether it was training, thoroughness, you know, pride in the job. And the instructions on the dash bottle perhaps were not particularly helpful. Um, but it shows that without changing anything, didn't take him any longer, didn't require any more equipment, chemicals or expenditure. But just by following those instructions and getting the procedure right, a big difference to risk is made. And then this was some work that my team did while I was at HSE, and it was comparing the two of the common types of flooring in hospital environments, thinking about the hygienic cleanability of floors. And we compared the typical ward floors smooth, shiny, polished vinyl put in there for infection control reasons, easy to manage, easy to clean. And then the safety vinyl surfaces in the showers. So the wet rooms and the wet areas where we knew people were exposed to a risk of slipping, typically those hospital rooms have slip resistant flooring in. And we did two things. We measured the slip resistance and we measured the amount of bacteria growing on the floor. And this is what we found, very self-explanatory. Um, it's not the clearest of graphs, but what we're looking at here is 8A on the very left is the smoothest, shiniest, most slippery floor that we found, all the way up to 12C, which was the most aggressive, roughest safety floor in any of the hospitals we visited. And this was across a number of hospitals in England and Wales. And then the bars, the red bar, similar to the previous graph, the red bar is the amount of bacteria that were growing on the floor when we turned up on the day. And we didn't announce that we were coming. So hospital management knew we were visiting, but the individual wards had no idea. So no special cleaning had been done. And we measured the amount of bacteria on the floor. And then we asked them to clean it. And again, we made it clear we weren't assessing them as individuals. We were just looking for how effective the current NHS cleaning manual was. And we looked at how much bacteria was left. And what we found was there was no relationship between slip resistance and hygienic cleanliness or cleaning effectiveness. So if we go right to the far right of that graph, floor 12C, the most aggressive, roughest safety vinyl floor, it was the only one we found in the entire study that was sterile 
when we got to it, so there was not a single bacterial colony growing on that floor. You could eat your dinner off it. You probably wouldn't want to. It was in a shower room floor, but you could do. All the rest of them, particularly down the, the far end, the eights, nines and tens, which were slippery floors when wet, had significant numbers of bacteria on. And some of them, 8C, 10A, for example, or even 11, had almost had very, very high levels of bacteria after cleaning with the standard cleaning regime. And although these were different hospitals and different wards, they were all using the same NHS procurement list for equipment, chemicals and items, and they were all cleaning to the same NHS cleaning manual. So there's roughly similar in terms of the way they approach the cleaning. I think there's two things here, one of which is if you've got a smooth, shiny vinyl floor, it's very easy to make it look clean. You can skate a mop over it a little bit and very quickly it looks smooth and shiny because it is. Perhaps because the safety vinyl floors are more matte and more dull by nature, people tend to put in a bit more effort cleaning them without really thinking about it. But they were all using the same equipment and the same cleaning procedures, and there was no relationship between hygiene and slip resistance. It's an assumption, but it's not necessarily true. And the same is true in food factories. We do a huge amount of work in food manufacturing, abattoirs, all sorts of interesting environments who have very, very high hygiene standards, and they are able to maintain excellent hygiene standards on slip resistant flooring in challenging wet manufacturing environments. It's perfectly possible, but the cleaning needs to be appropriate to the floor and the contaminant that you've got. And then finally, when it comes to managing cleaning, if the wet floor signs are out all day, every day, it's the boy who cried wolf. We get used to seeing them. They're not actually telling us about anything useful and people tend to ignore them. So right at the bottom of that hierarchy of control, we've got footwear. It's lowest down on that hierarchy, but often the easiest to implement and the most cost effective, but it might also be the only control available. So for cleaning staff who have to be on the smooth, shiny floors while they're wet because they're the ones wetting them. For outdoor workers, peripatetic workers, sales staff, delivery drivers, engineers, meter readers, anybody who has to go out and about on other people's premises in all manner of weather conditions, the only protection is what they've got on their feet. A lot of organizations in different areas will already issue PPE footwear for various reasons, whether it be slip resistance, toe protection, midsole protection, anti-static properties. So identifying a piece of footwear with a better level of slip resistance that offers all the other protective features they need and rolling it out as the old shoes wear out is essentially a zero cost solution for a significant saving, both in terms of management of risk and also financially. But again, getting good information can be difficult. And the challenge here is that the way that we test footwear is standardized pretty much around the world. There is a, a single standard across Europe for how you assess and then how you validate the slip resistance of footwear. And the same test method is used in the American standard, the ASTM, for how to test the slip resistance of footwear. And that standard is essentially not worth the paper it's written on. It can be seen as a minimum requirement to sell the shoes but it doesn't simulate what happens when a person walks. So it, it falls down immediately. You're not testing how good is this footwear in this condition and when does it fail? You're testing once you force the footwear to fail, how much grip is generated, which is not a question you're interested in. In the European standard, the pass thresholds are very low. So everything passes and they're about to revise those pass thresholds to put better surfaces in so that everything will pass because you're testing it on a really good floor. So unfortunately, by going by the standards alone, some research was done at a university in California that said if you test to the footwear standard, flip a coin and you have a 50-50 chance that the footwear that's passed that standard is any good. And that's a real challenge. There are better standards out there. So if you're assessing the slip resistance of footwear, um, the HSE have their own grip rating scheme. It's not a standard. It's not a requirement. But for people who are using footwear as a primary control for slip risk, it gives additional useful information generated from a valid test that is to do with pedestrian biomechanics and gives you useful information for making uh, a valid assessment of what level of risk you require. And there are several published studies, clinical trials, large scale clinical trials that prove that this can work. So the HSE did one of their own, looking at four and a half thousand workers in healthcare, half of whom were given slip resistant footwear, half of whom were left to select their own footwear as they always had done. And they found that offering and providing five star grip rated footwear reduced slips in NHS staff, despite the cost of providing the footwear, which the employer then had to 
stump up because that's what would be expected under the, the, the PPE regulations, it was still a cost benefit to do that because they were reducing risk, they were reducing absenteeism, they were reducing potential claims and so on. A similar study in the US looked at healthcare workers that focused being a US study a little bit more on claims. And they found that using the same brand of footwear, a five-star grip rated footwear, the workers who got the slip resistant shoes were 67% reduction in claims for slip injuries versus those that were buying their own slip resistant shoes. So in that study, the control group was still buying shoes branded as slip resistant according to the standard. But a 67% reduction shows you that that standard isn't helping people make an informed choice. So very briefly, because I do want to leave a few minutes for questions, I'm going to talk about preventing trips. And we come on to trips because they are typically that bit more simple. But because of that, we don't necessarily deal with them as well. We put a lot of effort into slips because it's relatively complex. When it comes to trips, the big scientific question is, how big is a trip hazard? And this is sort of it. The research shows us that for a healthy working age population, anything about 10 mil or above in height has the potential to cause somebody to trip. The likelihood of them tripping over that depends on how big it is, 10 mil versus 20 mil, whereabouts it is in terms of pedestrian foot traffic and how visible it is. So this 10 mil defect here on a bright sunny day in this walkway is relatively visible because of the shadow. But at a later time of day or a different time of year, it might be very, very difficult to see that. So when it comes to preventing trips, obviously, we want to eliminate holes, uneven surfaces, potholes and so on. But thinking about designating specific walkways for larger environments and clearly marking the boundaries, making sure there's enough storage for all equipment and particularly things like cleaning equipment during the planning phases of, of any building project so that things aren't left out underfoot. Um, waste disposal is obviously very important, but lighting and colour highlight, highlighting of permanent hazards, things like curbs in car parks and at crossings, single steps, changes in level in a building that aren't a full flight of stairs, anything underfoot that people might miss and might cause them to misplace their feet or to trip. And this is one where a clear and easy reporting system is really important. So if we come back to that first point about a good system that's engaging and gives feedback, if you've got a maintenance or a defect reporting system, for example, and you can say, you know, so-and-so left their tools out this morning, I moved them out of the way so that nobody tripped on them, that's great. But if you say there's a damaged tile in this area, I'm not in a position to fix that, can someone do something about it? If that's a quick, clear and easy reporting system that encourages engagement, people will let you know. They will, you'll crowdsource your risk assessment when it comes to slips and trips, particularly trips, because people will spot those hazards and you can do something about them proactively. I'm going to skip past this one because otherwise we're going to run out of time. I want to go on to stair falls um, and then we'll we'll round off. So stair falls in my line of work are the thing that kill the most people. Um, when you're falling on stairs, particularly in stair descent, you're falling from height and you're landing on an uneven surface. And so the likelihood of serious injury or fatality is significant. Um, falls on stairs are often seen as simply human error. But stair design has an enormous influence on the likelihood of somebody making that error. So the key things are the dimensions of the treads, how generous they are, how consistent they are. It's a very subconscious process walking up and down stairs. And our brains have to assume that the next tread is going to be the same as the one we just went to. It makes it a lot easier for that process. So even millimeter differences between adjacent treads can have a huge impact on risk. The visibility of the nosing or the edge of the tread, um, and we'll give some examples of that now just before I wrap up, and the design and availability of handrails. So thinking about nosing design, this is just one example I'll take for stair design. Looking at this picture, we can all work out where the edge of the treads are, sitting in front of a computer and sort of working it out. But as you're trying to use that surface and those stairs are moving relative to each other and there's something churning away underneath, it's quite difficult for you to identify the edge of those treads. And that makes it more difficult to accurately place your feet when descending those stairs and reduce the risk of you having a fall. I struggle to walk down these stairs. I'm not particularly good with gridded stairs anyway. And I kind of struggled down them. And then I, I almost jogged down the next set of stairs to catch up with the people who were showing me around site. This was a, a quarry visit that I did. And I thought to myself, why could I get down the second flight so much easier than I could get down this flight? And I went back and took a couple of pictures. 
The next flight of stairs has a nosing highlight, not an example of excellence. It's nothing fantastic. It's just a welded metal strip on the edge. But look how much easier it is for your brain to pick out where the treads are there compared to there. And it's because you're not doing it consciously. Unfortunately, you can't put a sign at the top of a flight of stairs that says be more careful and don't die and expect people to be more careful and not die because it's a subconscious process going up and down stairs. What you need to do is give people the right physical and visual cues to make those judgments accurately. It applies to all environments. Looking at this one, we've got a manufacturing environment, and this is quite obviously a set of three steps. But when you go into that control room at the top, do what you need to do and come back out again, it's far less obvious that it's a flight of three steps. From above, it's quite hard to see. The solution here was to highlight the edges. So a different way of doing it. Everyone can agree, bright yellow paint, fantastic. I would disagree. We tend to work on the assumption that yellow is safety. Yellow is the best color because look at it, it's so bright. When you're staring at that picture, it's really obvious that that yellow is there. But that isn't how we navigate environments. We scan ahead of ourselves and the majority of our sight, the majority of our perception, particularly on steps and stairs, when we're not staring at each tread as it goes, is using peripheral vision. And in your peripheral vision, you don't have the same color perception. So what becomes much more important in terms of providing good visual contrast is light reflectance value. So the amount of light that comes back off a surface. Now, yellow is only a good contrast material if the material that it's adjacent to has a very different light reflectance value, so a darker surface. It's why we use yellow and black. Yellow and black together are very, very different and they give good contrast. If we put this picture in black and white, the vision that you would have in your peripheral vision as you were navigating this stair, you'll notice that that highlight becomes far less effective. And it's very difficult to do because when you look at that, it's really obvious. But actually, scientifically, what your brain is taking in in terms of information is much more like this. And if we look at the black metal girders in the background, in both pictures, they remain extremely visible because against the pale concrete, they give very good light reflectance value contrast, but it's independent of color. So understanding some of these key technical aspects are really, really important. It doesn't take a lot to put a lick of paint on a stair to try and put the highlight right, but it also doesn't take a lot to accidentally get it wrong because we make assumptions about what these things are that give rise to risk and what a good simple solution looks like. The same is true of handrails. So here we've got a handrail that's painted the same color as the wall and the same issue is present about whether people identify the handrail in time when they need to use it to prevent a fall. So I'm going to summarize, you'll be very pleased to know, I'm sure I've drowned you all in information. There's a few key things that I think is worth bringing out that what people can generally do next and I think there's always room for improvement in terms of near miss and accident reporting and mapping understanding where the risks are in your organization so that you can then look to manage them proactively and there's lots of potential improvements that are very easy and simple to make reviewing cleaning regimes and cleaning management as simple as going and watching the cleaning being done and seeing if it's being done in practice as it is on paper and remembering that if it's not it doesn't mean that cleaning staff are at fault that they're deliberately avoiding what they've been asked to do. They may not understand what they've been asked to do. They may not have been trained properly. They may not have the time and the equipment to do things as they're written in the procedures. So it's about identifying realistically where those differences come from. And things like footwear specification can be very helpful if you've got the right information. But with the more technical aspects, you know, if you want a floor specification for a business, audit existing estates or design stair guidance, whatever it might be, those things we can assist with. Now, hopefully these key messages have come across, the first of which is falls can be prevented and the solutions are often simple, but you need the right evidence to get the right solution in order for it to be effective. And overall, beware of test data and expert opinion. There's a lot of misinformation out there, but in terms of any of that, you can always come to us and we'll be happy to assist. You've made it to the end. I'm very happy to take questions now, or if people have questions later on that come to them, I'm also happy for you to contact me on my email address. Well, many thanks. Um, I guess on behalf of uh, all of our viewers, uh, thank you very much. We have some questions uh, and I think um, like me, very insightful uh, and I'll read them in the order that we've received them and we'll see how many we get through in the, in the last five minutes. 
So uh, in no particular order, uh, Yves is asked, um, how can one ascertain the seriousness of granules and dry sand particles on shiny floors in terms of slip trips and falls? So what's the impact on shiny floors of, of contamination, which I, I guess is around granules and dry sand? Um, typically, some work was done at HSE on dry contaminants. It depends on particle size, but granules and dry contaminants can act as a lubricant just in the same way that water can. So on a smooth, shiny floor, um, probably a relatively high level of risk. That can be assessed with the pendulum test, which is the, the slip resistance test that HSE recommends. Super, thank you. And forgive me, uh, Kingsley, I think I read out your surname rather than your Christian name there. Uh, another question from, uh, from Jonathan. Is there a, a problem with too much grip? Um, are different grip ranges needed for different activities? Excellent question. Uh, generally speaking, no. Uh, in fact, the most grip you will ever get, it's a common misconception again, the most grip you will ever get is a clean, dry surface that is polished mirror smooth because you'll get maximum contact between the two materials. But nobody ever thinks of smooth, shiny tiles or glassy floors as being far too grippy. Um, within reason, I've not seen industrial surfaces that are so aggressive that they cause trips. In fact, you get less grip on those surfaces in the clean, dry condition. But the difference is that when you pour water on them, there's no change in friction. So typically, no. The only exception to that is for sports activities. Um, so there are certain surfaces in sports standards that you wouldn't want to use beyond a certain level of upper friction because you get turning and twisting injuries because of what you're doing. But for normal level walking, not an issue. Thank you very much. We had a nice comment from uh, Alfred. Uh, uh, just commending the presentation and thanking you very much, but also asking if the presentation's uh, available for download, noting that the recording will be available on uh, the IISM YouTube channel. Yes, absolutely. I'll provide a PDF of the slides so people have a copy. Super, thank you. Uh, and the last question so far, which comes from uh, Tony, have the manufacturers uh, of flooring or safety footwear been proactive in their approach to providing a product that assists with grip? Um, what is your experience? It's a very mixed bag. Um, there are some fantastic manufacturers of slip resistant footwear, um, slip resistant flooring, slip resistant floor treatments, all of whom are very much above board, produce a fantastic product that has great durability. Um, that's true of flooring in the ceramics industries, the, the soft flooring, vinyl industries, all sorts of, of products. Um, there are products that are not fit for certain environments that are sort of being sold into those environments for, for various reasons. But generally speaking, there are some fantastic products in all those areas made by good, reputable manufacturers. Super. Uh, and a couple of more additional uh, thank yous there as well uh, from, from Mike, uh, John and Daniel. Uh, and that leads us to the end of the questions. Um, I guess then, based on that, Rob, thank you once again on behalf of everyone. Uh, really insightful, some, some, um, some really, uh, I guess, fundamental somewhat would, upon reflection, obvious areas that we should all be looking at and often find that we don't. And uh, yeah, we certainly look forward to, uh, to catching up and discussing more of this in the future. So thank you once again, and thanks everyone for, for tuning in. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time.